Well, a warm welcome to you, and I am so thankful that you are here today to check out this message and worship with us.
Yeah, but... 
um, series of paperwork to you, and in that paperwork it will cover our official church meeting from uh, February, and then we had a board meeting this past week going over the summer schedule and summer calendar, and so uh, some people uh, will want to see that paper, because they, they weren't at that meeting, they found they've been nominated. <laughs> Austin turn around, Henry, turn, Henry said you and I both got nominated. <laughs> Uh, so we'll have those for you guys, and uh, just take them at your leisure, and you can look at them. Uh, of course, it'll cover everything that we kind of have going on for the next couple months of the church, who's in charge of things of that nature, and of course, uh, going back to our, um, our, our, board, our official church meeting in February, we'll have those uh, names on there to further help organize and administrate our church. Amen? Because that's important. And today, we bless and receive this offering, if you would pray with me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who is holy and righteous and calls us into holiness with him. And thankfully, Lord, you provide a way of holiness because through me there is no way of escape. Matter of fact, there is only bondage, but through you, Lord Jesus, you have provided a way of escape. And you've provided a way for me, and I want to provide a way for your community. Not just myself, but your ministry leaders, your, your ministry family here today, your sons and your daughters. They, God, want to see the kingdom of your kingdom advance this church growing because they are this church, because we are this church, because we are RHC. But Lord, because we serve you in your name, first and foremost, Lord, we pray and bless everything that is given today in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And the church would say amen. Amen. And then you got your Bibles, you can flip over to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, I'm going to pick up in verse 19. It's Matthew 16, verse 13. And while you're flipping there, hopefully none of you will have a problem with that, especially if you use your Bible is glowing. Amen? But while we're getting there, I have some thoughts that I want to share and kind of open while you find your text. My first thought is that I absolutely love the church. And I hope that you feel the exact same way. I've always held a high regard for the church and its leaders, even when I was in the world. I feel like church doesn't quite hold the same type of respect that it once used to hold, right? I feel like younger and younger generations do not value the reverence for church, but not often because they're just hooligans, but because it's not a part of our society. Let's face it, not everyone has a high reverence for the church. They don't hold a high opinion of the church or most churches unless they become a part of that church, right? For that matter, there are Christians that come to church every Sunday and they come to every event, but you know and I know that they don't even hold a high reverence even though they've attended everything. Therefore, the church often takes the blame for many things that it never should. I've seen a popular meme that's been floating around this week and I'm said, sorry, the church hurts you. That was a person, not Jesus. And that's true. As a matter of fact, I've had bad interactions at Texas Roadhouse with my waitresses or waiters, right? But I go back because I understand what Texas Roadhouse gives me, right? Jesus gave me something a whole lot better than an eight ounce Dallas filet medium rare, right? Jesus Christ gave me my life and some change to spare. So what happens is the church becomes a matter of perception over the reality of who the church really is. Jesus taking the blame for things that he has never done. And the church all the while going on with no black eye. But without a shadow of a doubt, I love the church. And I wouldn't change anything except for maybe some of the inhabitants. Some of you will catch that on the ride home maybe. But here's the most imperative thing that we need to know before we can ever get the image of a church in line. We have to have the image of Jesus Christ first. 
You see, the church is a reflection of who Jesus is. That's why we are called the bride. That's why we are called, you hear so oftentimes in theological circles, to walk to Christ-like or to be in Christ-likeness, to be in the image of what we were made in. And since God is an immaterial being, the first and foremost thing that we must understand through the creation of God is that we are created through spirit. Genesis 5 and 22, some Christians may need to adapt to take on the image of God. Can I get a witness? Hey, man, some, some other people will catch that on the ride home, too, because they're going to look it up. But we have to get the line of Jesus before we can get the line of us, or rather the image of us. He set the church forth, and the church is an embodiment of who he is. Church, listen to me, not vice versa. So we have to know who Jesus is, right? If you have your Bibles, you can see where I'll pick up in verse 13 of Matthew 16. The Bible says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Be careful before we read on in verse 16. Note that they answered him with what the world thought, with what the world saw. They fed him the perception. Right, right. Uh oh. He said to them, he saw that they fed the perception. And then he said to him, but who do you say that I am? I've already caught what the world's saying. And to be quite honest, Jesus knows that they're probably only sharing with him half the truth anyway, right? But Simon replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Watch that sentence in verse 18. Sometimes we get a little unclarity on this. Peter is a part of the rock. There's two pieces of the rock, the petro and the, and the uh, petros. One is feminine, one is masculine. They fit together perfectly. You are Peter. Remember, he calls him a rock. Right? That's the translation for this. And on this rock, Jesus, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosened in heaven. I want the next time you go to your prayer closet in doubt, I want you to take that verse with you. Matthew 16, 19. Let's pray. And then let's preach. Father, I thank you for this day that you have granted me, Lord God. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this word that you have put on my heart, Lord. And I thank you for everything that you have brought forth through your spirit this morning. Lord, there are times when I think I ought to go this way. Or, Lord God, I ought to go that way with the word. And Sister Angie asked me a couple of days ago, what are you preaching on? And I said, I don't really know. I'm, I'm still kind of waiting. I want to get into a series, Lord. And I'm not complaining in front of your children. As one of the children of Israel by any means. But God, you know, it's just not happening. And, and, and I don't even see that until after Father's Day. And that's fine. But today I feel, God, and I feel reassured that the word you have brought me, though God, it's not part of a series. And God, you know I like to preach them. That God, through the series of events that you've displayed through your Holy Spirit, Lord, I am on target this morning. Lord, I have found my bullseye, and Lord God, I don't even proclaim to be on the way there, God. I, I know the dart is failing, but I know I've already hit the target. Do you know how reassuring it is to preach under that perception and pretense? And Lord, I thank you for that this morning. Lord God, I hope that your people hear my heart. Most importantly, I hope that they hear your message and how you want this to be delivered today. And Lord, I pray that you would allow me to go through as you see fit this morning and not as I see fit. Amen. Amen. So what people saw, Jesus comes into this situation knowing that he's leading the disciples. Understand they will become the uh, uh, Matthias will join them eventually and they'll become the pillars, the apostles that are in heaven that are spoken of in Revelation. But as of now, Jesus is leading forth this group of disciples, right? 
the apostles to be the pillars of apostles in the book of Revelation. And he's bringing them forth, this early church, if you will, that hasn't quite been born in Acts 2 yet because the Spirit of God has not come down. But these are the men that will ratify. These are the men and women who are around them that will go forth, uh, uh, they will go forth uh, funding the gospel. They will go forth feeding the gospel. And they will go forth paying for the gospel. And Jesus brings these people to this place and he says, what are people saying about who I am? Jesus understood something was imperative because he needed them to understand what people were saying about him is what they were going to say about the church. Right? You remember when I opened up this morning, I said the church is an embodiment of who? Jesus Christ and not vice versa. We are into embody Jesus. When somebody drives by 302 State Street at 11 a.m. on a Saturday morning, they shouldn't see that Pastor Mike Collier is the spotlight highlight reel. They should see that I am the embodiment of Jesus Christ. Mavericks isn't smart trying to steal the show. Becca wasn't trying to steal the show. Come on, somebody. Uh, Taylor wasn't trying to steal the show. Sean killing it on the new rips wasn't trying to steal the show. Come on, this was about an embodiment of Jesus Christ. And Jesus knew that. And so he said, hey, what are people saying about what they see? What's the full going on? What's the deets? During the life of Christ, people had things to say about Jesus. They had a lot to say about who they thought and uh, who they expected him to be. And so what do people do when they have expectations? They label. What do you do when you're not real sure about somebody that just got introduced into your life and, and you know, or somebody that's new in a ministry or, or, or some new politician that comes into the area? Real quick, we start looking for the labels that are attached to them because that's how we are wired cognitively through our society. Our, our politic party, and I'm not on one or the other right here. I'm not trying to dog spot. I'm saying our Republicans and our Democrats, and I'll say it the other way if it makes somebody else feel better. Our Democrats and our Republicans, amen, have done this real good thing of getting us to label each other before we find out what each other. That's why that's all they do in their campaigns, right? That's X president is only this. And what is X president? Oh, X president is only this because it's easier to label and put a label forward. So Jesus steps in understanding that the labels are being printed, right? They're going out and, and people are sticking to them what they thought they ought to be. And he takes a consensus about himself and the embodiment around him to see what the world is saying. In other words, Jesus dropped the thermometer to see the temperature of the ministry going on around him and the understanding or revelation that those around him were seeing. Who do they say I am? Some responded quickly and they say, oh, there's only one answer we can give. Right? We want to give an answer that is good to somebody who is a mover and shaker of the kingdom. And so Jesus, people, uh, they've been saying some things about you. And some say that you are one of the prophets. Some say that you are Jeremiah or even Elijah, Lord. Some are talking real good things about you, Lord God. But Jesus knew there was some other things. He knew that the world would never be in agreement about who you were. Who you are, rather, because the world was never in agreement about who Jesus Christ himself was. Oh, why some were saying that you are Jeremiah and why some were saying that he was Elijah and one were saying that he was one of the great prophets. Let us not forget what those around him had to say about Jesus in the church, Jesus in his ministry, the apostle to come forth, our Messiah in flesh. Some mere, uh, uh, brought him to the mere revelation of a small time carpenter in Mark chapter six. They said this about Jesus Christ. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense of him. Now, when I read this for some reason, I just picture somebody who had just got their nails done and they are going through the list. Y'all know who I'm talking about, right? Ain't this so-and-so's cousin from the third side of the family twice removed? Come on now. Come on, you guys call it too with me. I'm going to read it. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Come on, right? You guys, right? Come on. And are not his sisters here with us? 
And so they were offended at him. The son of Joseph, they called him in 642 in the book of John. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? In John 9, 24, they said he's nothing but a sinner. Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner when they talk to the man that Jesus healed. We know this man is a sinner. Watch out, church. When indeed he was the creator, is the creator, and would always be the creator. And he merely touched his creation. Some called him a devil in Matthew 12, 22 through 24. They, uh, the Bible says that a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him. He is Jesus. So that the man spoke and saw and all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the, uh, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Jesus, of course, knowing their thoughts, said, listen, bro, a house divided cannot stand. Therefore, I am not the son of Beelzebub. I have not come on behalf of demons to cast out demons. And still some in John 10 and 20 said he has a demon. He is insane. And why listen to him? He is nothing more than a madman. You see, it is of my dearest opinion that when Jesus entered the area of Caesarea Philippi it was not only just trying to catch what people were saying of him but he was trying to get the disciples to understand the things that would come against them but furthermore he was trying to get the church to see who he is and understand who they are while there is labels on everything the church is no different. And you know it because you've heard it. Who does he think he is? How does he come to my barbecue and think he's holier than thou? He used to bring the drugs to our barbecue. And now he comes with that, you know, right? Come on, you guys. He used to bring the alcohol. She used to bring the alcohol, right? She used to be the lead gossiper. Come on. She used to be the whatever. And now look at him. You know what's next. And you catch those labels at time. Some people say you're too holy. Others say you're not holy enough. You have some that will argue and claim once saved, always saved, and try to about, uh, debunk rather the move of the spirit. And you have some that are so worried over the move of the spirit that they won't even have a conversation with people who study and and seek scholarly lead in God. You have churches from the south that want to divide from churches in the north and churches on the coast from churches in the Midlands. And what happens is, is we become a product of our labels. And it's one of the biggest problems that subdues our church today. The world doesn't want us, the church, when we ourselves Print our own labels of negativity. I know it's funny sometimes, and I said it the other day, and, and I apologized at Revival, and she, thankfully, was very understanding. But the first night of Revival, I, I had made a comment. And kind of nobody, there was a move in, of the Lord, and I kind of had felt everybody should have cheered for that move, you know? And nobody really did. And so I had made a comment, said, let's praise God for this moment or something, or and really nobody responded, you know, and I was just like, oh, okay, we're all just a bunch of Baptists then, you know. And it was funny, and she came to me, she was like, hey, I'm from the South Baptist Church right up the street. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I was seriously, I didn't think about it. It was, she was like, you're fine, honey. I knew how you meant it. I was like, okay, I apologize. I really didn't mean it negative that way, but I thought about it later. And wow, how demeaning, right? I thought it was funny, and then my rest of was like, oh my goodness, Pastor did that. And she laughed, and I got a laugh, but the Holy Spirit took me behind the shed, right? Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And here you are having a community revival. Your community member from South Baptist right up on the block came in. <laughs> and maybe not everybody thought that it was as funny as I did. Thankfully, she did. She didn't take the offense to it. But when we label ourselves, what is the world going to do? 
when we label ourselves as negative, when we speak other words on us, when we speak damnation on another believer. He's a junkie or she's a junkie and she'll always be. She's been promiscuous and she's been with a lot of guys or that he's always slept around and yada yada and that's who he will always be. I, I remind you that people change, y'all. Come on, somebody. Satan, Lucifer was once an angel. Come on, somebody. Hey, can I hear preach for a minute? People can change and I don't want Lucifer to be your role model by any means, but I'm saying he was once kicking it with Jesus. Now he's waiting on the lake of fire. Can I get a witness? People change. Things change. And so while we are walking around with our labels, maybe we should be walking around with our magic erasers. Come on. And letting the children of God proclaim who they are. And so that is what has happened here in their day and even so needs to be happening in our day because we need to get off of this focus of perception and move to the reality of what is. We get all messed up when we are consumed with how it should look. We get into a narrow vision of tunnel vision. Come on, you ever been to a tunnel and you just can't wait to get out of that tunnel because the light's on the side? I mean, sometimes they look really cool like you're going through warp speed, but sometimes that tunnel, if you're in there too long and you're in there during the night, come on, you've been, I don't know if all of y'all been through it, but I've been one through going through uh, West Virginia into Pittsburgh. I love it. 99.99% of the time I love this tunnel, but every now and again that tunnel gets me and I can't wait to get out because it just starts narrowing in. You see the lights and everything becomes distorted. Come on church, I'm trying to get us out of the mindset of being consumed in narrow tunnel vision. That it's all about me and my ministry and my Pentecostal or my Pentecostal background or my heritage. This is about Jesus Christ who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and His heritage and His kingdom and the fact that He will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Not how I see fit, but how He sees fit. Amen? It's no longer needing to be doom and gloom up in the place. No longer do we need to allow the words of the church is dying over America. No longer do we need to allow the words of the devil is winning. When my scripture has a whole lot to say about who Jesus is and about who I am in Jesus Christ. John 1 and 12 says I am a child of God. John 15 1 and 5 says I am the branch of the true vine and therefore I am a conduit of Christ's life. John 15 and 15 says I am a friend of Jesus. Romans 6 and 6 says my old self was crucified with Christ and I am no longer a slave to sin. Come on, if you're walking in bondage, today you need that verse. As a child of God, I'm a fellow heir with Christ. Romans 8 and 17, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of me. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, I am a new creature in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, I'm a chosen, holy, and blameless person before God. Ephesians one and four. I hope I'm talking to somebody today. For grace you have been saved. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2 and 8. The Bible tells us in Philippians 3 and 20 that I am a citizen of heaven and I wish somebody would praise God if you found your identity in there somewhere. So Jesus sets the matter straight he says, but who do you say that I am? There were Jesus' closest students and his closest friends. And he wanted him to know. And he wanted to know what they were thinking. He wanted to know, where are you landing in all of this? You are the ones that I have chose to go shake this world upside down in my name. What is your perception? Do you follow a small carpenter, a madman, a demon, Beelzebub? Or are you a child of God today? Are you a branch of the true vine? Do you see yourself as a friend of Jesus Christ this morning? Because if not, we can make that a thing. You can run right to this altar in a minute. We're going to all stand and we can just run right out of it. I want to be a friend of Jesus. The Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's super easy. You make a confession today that you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And we worry about all the other stuff later. It works. Trust me. I did the diet. I stuck with it. It works. Where are you landing in all of this?
this. See, I know who Jesus is. And the world has their opinion of who Jesus is. But if Jesus is found in the embodiment of the church and you are the church, then where are you in this today? When you go out and the world sees you, will they see a madman? And if they claim to see a madman, will you show them one? Will you show them the righteousness of Christ? We were talking about Jesus flipping the tables in the temple the other day, Colton. And uh, somebody was doing something. And I forget, I don't even remember where it were. Oh, it was a group of people, and they were being super obnoxious while we were out to eat. Colton's like, I wish Jesus was here. He's going to flip that table over, teach these people a lesson. <laughs> All right, I got, you know. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean we've covered everything in the house, okay? <laughs> but at Colt's expense, will they see an anger that irritates or a righteous anger that seems to drive out sin and save the lost? For after all, I am an embodiment of Jesus Christ. You are the ones that I have chosen. If you don't believe it, go get in your Bible. Matthew 28 and 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Mark 16 and 15. He tells us to go into the whole of creation, the whole of creation, and to declare his gospel. And Luke 24, he says that he is sending us forth as his witnesses. In John 20 and 21, he says, as the Father is sending me, I too am sending you. In Acts chapter 1, he reminds them before he sends them to heaven again that they are his witnesses. You are the ones I have chosen. Come on, somebody. I'm literally talking to you today, and I hope you're receiving the revelation that I'm giving to you today, right? You are the ones. I'm, I'm literally like saying it like I was Jesus. You are the ones that I have chosen I want you to know today there's a reason that our church says like no other I'm not saying that we go out and be big green plums in society but God could really use some people that if they quit trying to fit into society so much really just try to fit into what he already has carved out for you after all he says that my yoke is easy and my burden is light Miss Sue if I can just borrow some of your teaching from Thursday night Bible study Miss Sue talked about the ox and what would happen when that ox is yoked they would take a strong ox I was watching as a matter of fact massive bulls being released from their pen the other day we're talking massive creatures two three four tons Thousands of pounds being released. And, and, and what they would do is they'd take a big ox and they'd put a small ox, a, a teenage ox on it, not as strong. And that ox would learn through the yoke. And Jesus knew that that yoke was heavy and that yoke was hard. If daddy ox, senior ox wants to go this way, junior's going that way. What this ox wants, the big ox, the lead ox, the little ox gets, and it often comes through a pulling and a prodding on the neck because the bigger ox controls the yoke. And so when Jesus said this, he knew that there was a pulling. Listen, that's the world. When we're trying to fit into the, you ever notice that? that no matter what you get from the world, there's always something coming back to slam you. You get a new whip and it looks real good. Come on, now you don't got the right shoes. Now you don't make enough money. Now you don't live in a big enough house. Now your kids don't act right. Come on somebody do you hear me no matter what you fix in your life there's something that keeps slamming into you because we're trying to follow after the yoke of the world and Jesus said if you would just catch what I'm trying to say to you my yoke is easy my burden shall be light I'm not going to pull you and toss you to and fro I'm just looking God just looking for some people that I have a yoke that especially been fitting for you come on somebody Jesus is going to build and has built his church on the backs of men and women 
who can sense the Father in the best times and in the worst times. Through COVID-19, through we thought we beat it, and then everybody in the church seemed to have got it all at the same time from some outside sources, and we're almost all the way through COVID trying to figure out why we're going virtual again. Okay, nobody in the church house. To some people agreeing or disagreeing how COVID is dealt with or whatever the case may be. Some people just getting into habits of not going to church. I have bishops on my page that are administrative bishops of states. These are not people who are looking to get people just in the seat because they need um, um, attendance record. They're bishops. They need to stay. Their attendance is pretty fixed. Bishop Martin has 225 churches, right? That's his number, right? And he can plans to keep 225 churches or plan more. There are bishops regularly posting that administrate the state, calling people to get back in the church because we've made it so comfortable to stay at home. That's not what Jesus built. Come on, somebody. I get it. There are some days we got to go to kickball or basketball or whatever. Life calls, and there are days we have to be at work. There's a family, a group of family that I know that at a, a baptismal at another church because a nephew is getting baptized, and they should be there, right? They're at church. I really don't care where you go to church. If you're watching live stream, I don't care if the only thing you like about me is how I preach, and you can't stand nothing about me else other than how I preach. Watch me preach and go to another church. I don't care because God. God is not looking for some people that will hear me preach. I want you to hear me today. God is looking for men and women who will stand up and answer the call. That will understand who they are in Jesus Christ. Come on, brother. People that will understand who they are in Jesus Christ. And this revelation will come through a divine resource. And he will pour it out on his Holy Spirit. And he did so on the day of Pentecost. And he continues to do so in your life. Jesus is a builder one day at a time. One brick at a time on top of another. And so it is with his church. One brick on top of another brick. One day on top of another. Jesus is placing the pieces where we go. Building the path of our life. But no matter the case, you can rest assured that Christ's hand is in it. If Christ's hand is in it. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. No matter what we face. I said, because I, I felt like well, I need to give a personal praise break on that one. <laughs> I said, no matter what happens, if the hand of God is in it, the gates of hell will never prevail no matter what this church faces. Come on. This is my praise break. Y'all can do what y'all need to do. Come on, Lord. I, I believe it, Lord God. I receive it, Lord Jesus. You are worthy. God's hand's been in it all along. Haggai 2, 6 through 9 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give uh, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts and declares Pastor Mike Collier as well. As you stand all over this church today, if you're able, this is his church. And those people that I described are you. You are a child of God. You are a true. You are a branch of the true vine. You are a friend of Jesus. You are crucified with Christ. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are a child of God. You are a fellow heir with Christ. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. You are chosen. You are holy. You are blameless before God. I wish somebody would just say amen right there. Come on. For by grace you have been saved through faith. I, you, my friend, are a citizen of heaven. Somebody say amen in this house. Amen. Come on. We're about to worship and we're about to pray. The first thing I feel like I want to pray on right now, I just want, uh, actually, I want somebody to go hit light one and two for me back there in the main two lights. Thank you. 
the first thing I want to just throw out is doubt. If you've got doubt in your life at all about who you are in Jesus Christ, invade these altars. Come on. Sister Shay, I need you. Uh, uh, Sue, I need you to come. Come on. There are some people that are about to come. If you have doubt about who you are in Jesus Christ today, you need to be at this altar because we're about to anoint you. We're about to appoint you. We're about to call you forth into the kingdom of God because that's where you deserve to be called forward. Is there anybody in here today that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I want to pray with you today. Come on quickly, quickly. Is there anybody in here today that your relationship with Jesus Christ isn't where you feel it should be? I want to pray with you. Come on, anybody in here who And then I want to pray for the people that say, you know what? I feel what you said about me in Jesus Christ today, but I need the anointing of the Spirit to go forth in His courage, in His power, and I need that to go forward. I need the anointing of the Lord today on my life to step into ministry. If that's you, I want you to come right now. I want you to come right now. Come on, there are people praying at their seats right now. It's such a beautiful thing. If you've taken your seat and made it an altar personally for you, keep praying. Ignore me right now. If you're standing and that's a place of altar for you, uh, ignore me right now. If there's not a specific prayer on your mind and in your heart right at this moment, I would like to direct us back to the, to the temple that we, we spoke about on the day of Pentecost and the dedication that Solomon put forward. You may remember that what the scripture said was that we are the temple coming from Paul and, and, and Solomon said there that anyone who is praying toward or in the temple or toward the temple, God asked for them to hear. So if you're not in a personal place of prayer today, I ask that you would stretch your hands towards this altar and you would begin to pray towards these temples that are standing here before us. As we How awesome it was to be in worship today with you. We'd like for you to learn more about our church at risenhopechurch.com. You can also check us out at Facebook or Instagram. Better yet, we'd love to see you in person, 302 State Street, every Sunday at 11 a.m. We hope to see you soon.